Ready to go here, everybody. We're going to get started here in about 30 seconds, so buckle up. Just want to make sure everybody's on board when we get rolling here. All righty. Welcome, everybody, to Patriots History of the United States. I'm Larry Swikart. I had some people say I need to be a little bit louder. My mic is up, so I don't know, turn your volume up more? Anyway, welcome. As you know, this is my series in which I'm going to be reading through our great book, A Patriots History of the United States, Beginning to End making extensive commentary and having in extensive discussions and some very in detail comparisons, contrasts, um, references. I want you to get the most recent stuff that I know about. And so um, that's where we are today. Now, our last two times we read through the foreword and the introduction. I'm not going to do a big review every time because that would eat up too much time. But just by way of a quick review, we looked at the four pillars of American exceptionalism, and that would be a Christian, mostly Protestant, religious tradition, and that was important not for reasons of theology, but because of reasons of church governance. It was bottom-up church governance, and that worked very well with pillar number two, which was common law. Common law was the notion that God put the law in the hearts of the people, the people elected or selected uh, rulers or leaders who would uh, carry out their, their uh, goals, desires, their wishes. Again, bottom up. So the first two pillars that we talked about last time, whether it was religion or politics, were bottom up. Pillar number three was private property with written titles and deeds, and I explained to you why that was so critical in terms of first building yet another barrier between the individual and the state. Not an impenetrable barrier, but just one more. The goal in all of American history and constitution <clears throat> was to set up <coughs> excuse me, as many obstacles between the individual and the, the federal government as possible, to make it as hard as possible for the federal government to uh, interact with or oppress or uh, attack an individual at any point, okay? And so uh, private property with written titles and deeds, the important part was the written titles and deeds. Because while, yes, a monarch or a dictator can still take your land, even if you have written titles and deeds, it makes it just one step harder, which is why the uh, nobles in 1215 forced John to sign the Magna Carta Again, he still took people's lands from time to time. So did other kings. It just made it that much harder. Okay, and then the fourth pillar was a free market economy, which showed up in, in Plymouth in 1630, and they began their first mill there, and they had division of labor. And so you had all four pillars present in Plymouth by 1630, but not in Jamestown, because Jamestown was an Anglican colony and it was a colony governed from England uh, via the governor's uh, board of governors of the London Company and so on and so forth. So that's where we ended off last time. The introduction brings those out because we're going to see them repeated over and over as a key element of American history. All right, let's get started now in our latest episode, which is chapter one. Again, I'm reading from Patriots History of the United States. Chapter 1, The City on a Hill, 1492 to 1707. And the header is The Age of European Discovery. God, glory, and gold, not necessarily in that order, took post-Renaissance Europeans to parts of the globe they had never before seen. The opportunity to gain materially while bringing the gospel to non-Christians offered powerful incentives to explorers from Portugal, Spain, England, and France to embark on dangerous journeys 
I'm sorry, dangerous voyages of discovery in the 1400s. Certainly they were not the first to sail to the Western Hemisphere. Norse sailors had reached the coast of Iceland in 874 AD and Greenland a century later. And legends of recorded Leif Erikson's establishment of a colony in Vinland, somewhere on the northern Canadian coast, well, we have that as well. Whatever the fate of Vinland, its historical impact was minimal and significant voyages of discovery did not occur for more than 500 years when trade with the Orient beckoned. Marco Polo and other travelers to Cathay, which is what they then called China, had brought fantastic tales of wealth in the East and returned with unusual spices, dyes, rugs, silks, and other goods. But this was difficult. Long journey. I'm sorry, this was a difficult long journey. Land routes crossed dangerous territories, including imposing mountains and vast deserts of modern day Afghanistan, northern India, Iran, and Iraq, and required expensive and well protected caravans to reach Europe and Asia. You got to remember at this time, every one of those areas was populated heavily with bandit tribes, and they were going to attack and loot anybody who came through their land who wasn't sufficiently guarded by enough security at that time. So you had to have a, a pretty serious caravan going. Merchants encountered bandits who threatened transportation lanes, kings and potentates who demanded tribute, and bloodthirsty killers who pillaged for pleasure. Trade routes from Bombay to Goa reached Europe via Persia or Arabia crossing the Ottoman Empire with its internal taxes. Cargo had to be unloaded at seaports, then reloaded at Alexandria or Antioch for water transportation across the Mediterranean, or continued on land before crossing the Dardanelles Strait into modern-day Bulgaria to the Danube River. European demand for such goods seemed endless enticing merchants and their investors to engage in a relentless search for lower costs brought by safer and cheaper routes. Ultimately, I'm sorry, gradually, Europeans concluded that more direct water routes to the Far East must exist. The search for Cathay's treasure coincided with three factors that made long ocean voyages possible. First, Sailing and shipbuilding technology had advanced rapidly in the 9th century AD, thanks in part to the Arabs' development of the astrolabe, a device with a pivoted limb that established the sun's altitude above the horizon. By the late 10th century, astrolabe technology had made its way to Spain, but was useful only in conjunction with the new clock technology, so you could really figure out where you were going and how fast you were traveling. That was key. Um, and I want to look at this note here with you, uh, note three, because I think this cites a very important book, if I recall. Okay, and that is, uh, yes, James Burke's Connections. If you've never read Burke's book, Connections, he used to have a fantastic television series where he would show you the connections between all of these things. It was really great. But take a look at his book, Connections. And there is also a book by uh, David Landis, L-A-N-D-E-S. I don't cite it in this note, but I cite it somewhere else. And uh, it's called Revolution in Time. And he talks about how over time people began to measure and calculate time and what each increment in being able to do that better meant. So you might want to take a look at that book as we move on. Farther north, Vikings pioneered new methods of hull construction. Among them, the use of overlapping planks for internal support that enabled vessels to withstand violent ocean storms. Sailors of the Hanseatic League states on the Baltic coast experimented with larger ship designs that incorporated stern post rudders for better control. Yet improved ships alone were not enough. Explorers needed the accurate maps generated by Italian seamen and sparked by the new inquisitive impulse 
of the revolution. Thus, a wide range of technologies coalesce to encourage long range of voyages of discovery. And let me mention right here, my director for the movie Rock and the Wall was a big uh, advocate of space travel, very interested in space travel. And he used to say all the time, only a free society really engages in exploration. Other societies have no need to explore. Now you say, well, what about the communists in the Cold War? Well, the race to space, in their view, was not to gain knowledge. It was not for simple scientific exploration. Their real main goal was simply to beat us for propaganda value. So yes, they did go into outer space, but it wasn't to try and actually understand something better. It was to try, try to gain a leg up on the Americanskis, all right? Political changes, a second factor giving birth to the age of discovery, resulted from the efforts of several ambitious European monarchs to consolidate their possessions into larger, cohesive, dynamic states. This unification of lands, which increased the taxable base within kingdoms, greatly increased the funding available to expeditions and provided better military protection in the form of warships at no cost to investors. So this is actually an interesting dynamic that begins to appear, is that private investors are looking to get the state to cover some of their expenses in terms of, of defense and maybe some supplies. And the state, at the same time, is trying to use private investors to offset a lot of the expense of discovery for places they might want to build um, forts, seaports, later as we get into the late 1800s, coaling stations. So uh, who's, who's zooming whom, Aretha Franklin saying? Who's using whom? Uh, they're each trying to use each other. I mean, nothing wrong with that. That's just the reality that, that nobody here is totally pure of motive. They're each trying to use each other. By the time a combined Venetian-Spanish fleet defeated a much larger Ottoman force at Lepanto in 1571, the vessels of Christian nations could essentially sail with impunity anywhere in the Mediterranean. Uh, this is a key battle in 1571, written about by Victor Davis Hanson in his uh, great book, uh, Carnage and Culture. If you don't know that book or don't have that book, you will want to get it and take a look at that. It's, um, it, it's one of those must-reads. And at the Battle of Lepanto, an outnumbered um, Christian fleet fought off and defeated a much larger Muslim fleet and inflicted horrific casualties, mostly because they had some, uh, just a few, six uh, giant ships called galleasses that had far more cannons on them and better cannons than anything the Muslims had, and they stationed those out front like kind of moving forts and blasted apart the Muslim navy before it even really got into close contact with the Europeans. And once the Europeans got in close contact, they, they uh, defeated the Muslim force uh, very, very badly. And this opened up the whole Mediterranean, as I just read there, for trade and, and other uh, commerce, exploration, whatnot. One of the key elements of uh, the Battle of Lepanto that needs to be mentioned here is, as Hansen shows, the Western militaries had by this time uh, gone through the Renaissance or were going through uh, the Renaissance and were starting to emphasize the scientific revolution that we'll talk about a little bit later. And so they were interested in whatever worked. It didn't matter if, if God approved or not. If something worked, that was what they were going to use. And so they, they constantly tinkered with this. Is this the best design? Is this what we can, can we do better? And no king or prince got upset because you were using a better cannon. They wanted... They wanted the efficiency. They wanted the power. So after the defeat at Lepanto, one of the viziers 
uh, went to the uh, great sultan, and, and I think it was uh, Saladin. Uh, I could be wrong on that. And uh, it could be Suleiman. I, I get my Suleimans and Saladins, uh, Saladins mixed up. I think it's Suleiman. And uh, anyway, he said, uh, uh, oh, oh, great sultan, um, it's not a big deal. We can outfit a whole new fleet with silken sails and golden rigging within a month, something like that. And he, he totally missed the point. It wasn't about what the fleet looked like. It's what technology did you have? And at that time, the Turks were using cannon technology that they had to uh, steal uh, from the Europeans, or in one case, they got a Hungarian trader to come over and show them the technology. But even showing them the technology wasn't enough because stuff breaks. And you have to know not only how to fix it, but how to make more on your own. But by the time you learn how to make more, kind of reverse engineer that technology, you got a problem because the Europeans have already moved on because they're already engaged in feedback loops of improving their own technology still more. So it's just a little note there on this very important battle of Lepanto. Then, in control of the Mediterranean, Europeans could consider voyages of much longer duration and cost than they ever had in the past. A new generation of explorers found that monarchs could support even more expensive undertakings that integrated the monarch's interests with those of the merchants. As I said, they're each trying to use each other. Third, the Protestant Reformation of 1517 fostered a fierce and bloody competition for power and territory between Catholic and Protestant nations that reinforced national concerns. England competed for land with Spain, not merely for economic and political reasons, but because the English feared the possibility that Spain might Catholicize numbers of non-Christians in new lands, whereas Catholics trembled at the thoughts of subjecting natives to Protestant heresies. Therefore, even when economic or political gains for discovering colonization may have been marginal, monarchs had strong religious incentives to open their royal treasuries to support such missions. And, and so, in essence, we're talking about competition. Competition was good. Uh, almost all scholars cite the fact that competition between the nation states uh, for power led to them being willing to adopt or, or take on any new technology. And, and you know all about Leonardo da Vinci and how the Italian city-states were, were lusting after his weird designs and possible better cannons and that he may have invented an early tank, all these kinds of things. So um, competition was good in the sense that it produced a steadily improving uh, stream of technology and new ideas, uh, all because you know the Protestants wanted to get the better of the Catholics and the Catholics wanted to get the better of the Protestants, and so on. Okay, next up in the book is the timeline. I'm not going to read you the timeline. We're going to skip through the timeline and go right to the next subheader, which is Sp Portugal and Spain. <coughs> Excuse me, the explorers. <coughs> Excuse me again. Ironically, one of the smallest of the new monarchical states, Portugal, became the first to subsidize extensive exploration in the 15th century. The most famous of the Portuguese explorers, Prince Henry, dubbed the Navigator, was the brother of King Edward of Portugal. Henry, and the dates are 1394 to 1460, had earned a reputation as a tenacious fighter in North Africa against the Moors, that's what they called the Muslims in North Africa, and he hoped to roll back the Muslim invaders and reclaim from them trade routes and territory. A true Renaissance man, Henry immersed himself in map-making and exploration from a coastal center he established at Sagres on the southern point of Portugal. There, he trained navigators and mapmakers, dispatched ships to probe the African coast, and evaluated the reports of sailors who returned from the Azores. Portuguese captains made contact with Arabs and Africans in coastal areas and established trading centers from which they brought ivory and gold to Portugal. 
then transported slaves to a variety of Mediterranean estates. This early slave trade was conducted through Arab middlemen or African traders who carried out slaving expeditions in the interior and exchanged captive men, women, and children for fish, wine, salt on the coast. Henry saw these relatively small trading outposts as only the first step in developing reliable water routes to the east. Daring sailors trained at Henry's school soon pushed further southward, finally rounding the Cape of Storms in 1486 when Bartholomew Dias was blown off course by fantastic winds. King John II eventually changed the name of the Cape to the Cape of Good Hope, reflecting the promise of a new route to India offered by Diaz's discovery. That promise became reality in 1498 after Vasco da Gama sailed to Calicut, India. An abrupt decline in Portuguese fortunes led to her eclipse by a larger Spain, reducing the resources available for investment and exploration and limiting Portuguese voyages to the Indian Ocean to an occasional, quote, boatload of convicts. Moreover, the prize for which the Portuguese explorers had risked so much now seems small in comparison to that discovered by their rivals, uh, the Spanish, under the bold seamanship of Christopher Columbus, a man the king of Portugal had once refused to fund. Now, uh, let me say this about Columbus. The very best book on Columbus, it's a pretty thick book, is um, published by University of Oklahoma Press, and it's called Columbus Then and Now. Columbus Then and Now. Let me see if I can quickly get to the end notes there and give you the author. I forget the author's name, but this is a good one. You're, you're going to want to get that if, if you want to have any discussions at all about Columbus. Let's see. Columbus Then and Now, by Miles Davidson. Columbus Then and Now, A Life Reconsidered. And you'll want to, of course, use this with Christopher Columbus, the diaries of Christopher Columbus, um, which were published by the University of Oklahoma Press in 1989. Um, <clears throat> Davidson's book, Columbus Then and Now, is really good because I think so many times historians will kind of tie themselves to a position or a view that hasn't been fully confirmed. And one of the best things about Davidson's book is on many occasions, he will give you a couple of alternative views, but in the end he'll say, but we just don't know. And I think that that's so true, especially the further back in history you get, Many times you just don't know. And, and it's worth saying we don't know. So think about picking up Columbus Then and Now by Davidson. It's a very good book. Indeed, almost everyone refused to fund Columbus. He made seven presentations to various committees, monarchs, and other parties before King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella underwrote the journey. Those of you who are older than 50 will remember the old Bugs Bunny cartoon where he's playing Columbus and the world as she's around uh, and the king of the world as she's a flat and they go back and forth like this. Um, but anyway, I always think of that scene when I get to this part of the book. This in itself was miraculous for had his funding come from England, France, or Portugal, he, Columbus, would have departed from the Azores or Bristol and not picked up the crucial northeast trade wind, having departed from Spain in August 1492, however, and laying in a course to the Canary Islands, Columbus sailed due west for what he thought was a direct line to Japan, although he never mentioned Cathay prior to 1493. A native of Genoa, Columbus embodied the best of a new generation of navigators, resilient, courageous, and confident, in his Book of Prophecies, he recounted his preparation for his mission, saying, quote, I have had commerce and conversation with knowledgeable people of the clergy and the laity, Latins and Greeks, 
Jews and Moors, and our Lord has endowed me with a great talent for seamanship, sufficient ability in astrology. By that, he didn't mean, you know, an astrologer. He meant astronomy. That's what they called it back then. In astrology, geometry, and arithmetic, and the mental and physical dexterity required to draw spherical maps. To be sure, Columbus wanted glory, and motivation born of desperation fueled his vision. At the same time, Columbus, quote, was earnestly desirous of taking Christianity to heathen lands. Now, repeatedly, we see in Columbus's life that he was a devout Christian. And it's not, it's not some pretense for going to the new world. It's not, uh, I'm, I'm using religion as a cover so I can get rich. That wasn't the case at all. Now, nobody cared that you got rich. I mean, they all wanted to get rich. That's why the opening line was God, glory, and gold, not necessarily in that order. They all wanted to get rich. But it's important also to understand that they're religious feelings their christianity was real it was deep they meant it when they said they wanted to christianize the the heathen okay it's not just some pretense for acquiring slaves or conquering people all right he did not as is popularly believed originate the idea that the earth is round as early as 1480, for example, he read works proclaiming the sphericity of the planet. But knowing intellectually that the earth is round and demonstrating it physically are two different things. And it very possibly could have fallen to the Chinese to prove it had not, upon the return of the imposing treasure fleet in 1423, turned inward and under Emperor Zhu Gaoji, scrapped the fleet. Uh, now, this is a very interesting development because scholars will say, well, see, the Chinese had these fleets. Well, yeah, they did. The Chinese Golden Fleet, as it was called, uh, sailed out and uh, before Columbus and went through the Indian Ocean and reached the uh, uh, eastern edges of Africa. And then they came back. And there's among Chinese scholars or scholars of China... Uh, there, there's great um, debate about what was this golden fleet doing. Were they looking for gold? Were they looking for more, more gold? Um, some argue that they were actually on a manhunt, seeking the previous emperor who had fled, and they wanted to catch him and execute him so he would not pose a threat to the reigning emperor. Um, at any rate, the Chinese ships or the large-scale junks were pretty advanced ships for the day but they come back to china and there's a um, change of attitude within the chinese government and they decide they do not want to do any more exploration they don't want to put any more money at all into ships they're going to put their money into armies because after all china's a land nation we don't need to be worried about ships so they stop exploring and, and this is a very big deal. You know, they, they don't continue to explore and they kind of open the whole field to the Europeans. By 1500, anyone constructing a Chinese vessel with more than two masts faced the death penalty. Can you believe that? Even on your own money, they would kill you if you built a ship with more than two masts capable of sailing out to the deep ocean. Thus, whether one considers it divine providence or pure luck, Columbus appeared at precisely the right time in human history to discover the new world. Now, if we're going to be fair, if we're going to be true scientists, then we have to always hold open the possibility of divine intervention. Yes, there may be a whole line of other things, that are more accurate or are accurate at this time. But I don't think any true scholar can ever say, well, you know, this could be God. Because it could be. It could be. We don't know at this point. But this is an interesting point where the world changes and uh, could have gone a very different direction had Columbus come, as I said, from England, from 
uh, some other country or had the Chinese kept exploring. Columbus's fleet consisted of only three vessels, you know them, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, and a crew of 90 men. Leaving port in August 1492, the expedition eventually passed the point where the sailors expected to find Japan, generating no small degree of anxiety, whereupon Columbus used every managerial skill he possessed to maintain discipline and encourage hope. The mere fact that he did not hug the shorelines but went cross-ocean was itself daring and unusual. But the voyage had stretched to 10 weeks when the crew bordered on mutiny, and only the captain's reassurance and ex exhortations persuaded the sailors to continue a few more days. Finally, on October 11, 1492, they started to see signs of land. Pieces of wood loaded with barnacles, green bulrushes, and other vegetation. A lookout spotted land, and on October 12, 1492, the courageous band waded ashore on Watling Island in the Bahamas, where his men begged his pardon for doubting him. Now, two things here. First, we don't know for sure that he landed at Watling Island. That's the consensus. But as Davidson shows, there are arguments that he may have landed somewhere else. It's one of those things where we just don't know. Second uh, really important point here, though, is what was Columbus really thinking? And this is highly debated among historians. There are those who insist he was going to China, that he thought he found a water route to China. Samuel Elliot Morrison, the great naval historian of World War II, uh, extensively studied Columbus. And he called Columbus the greatest natural navigator in human history, that he just knew where he was going, right? You know people like that. Uh, the, the little compass thing in the car will say you're going north and you should be going, you know, west or something. You're, What's going on? He said, trust me, I know where I'm going. And then you'll find a back road that will take you exactly where you're going, only faster. That's kind of like Columbus. And Morrison argues that Columbus knew he wasn't going to China. That he knew he was setting out for something new, totally different, never before seen. But he couldn't tell the sailors that because they wouldn't go. Um, he couldn't tell Ferdinand and Isabella that because they wouldn't fund him. And so he kept that to himself. Um, this business about knowing the world is round, but actually going out and, and proving it by doing it, it, it kind of reminds me of an old story about a guy, tightrope walker, who stretched a wire from one side of Niagara Falls to the other and put out all sorts of publicity and giant crowds gathered to see him walk across Niagara Falls on this tightrope. And he did it. Walks over, walks back, everybody cheers. Yay, what a guy. Next, he takes a wheelbarrow and he pushes it all the way across to the other side and comes back pushing this wheelbarrow in this little tightrope. And the crowd's going crazy. Yay, oh, amazing. He, he then puts a whole bunch of bricks in the wheelbarrow. And he looks at the crowd and he says, Now, how many of you think that I can cross that wire again with this load of bricks in the wheelbarrow. And everybody's hand goes up. He looks at one guy and he empties the wheelbarrow and he says, get in, <laughs> right? That's what Columbus did. He emptied the wheelbarrow and he said to those soldiers, get in. But he told them, don't worry, uh, we've got all sorts of safety, safety nets and stuff and we're going to China. He, he didn't tell them we're going to go someplace I've never even been. Don't know if it exists, but we're going to see. Okay. All right. Uh, so let me back up. A lookout spotted landing on October 12, 1492. The courageous band waited ashore on Watling Island in the Bahamas where his men begged his forgiveness for doubting him. And I add, it should be noted that the actual location of Columbus's landing remains in hot dispute. An elaborate study by the National Geographic Society resulted in, quote, total disagreement as to where he landed because scholars all started with different 
and unprovable assumption. So that's another thing you have to look at is when you're trying to say, well, where did Columbus end up? You have to really figure out where he started. And there's great disagreement about where he actually started. It's like almost any uh, chart in economics or history, you can prove almost anything based on what your starting point is. The, the Biden people do this all the time with economics. You know, they, they try to uh, start things from uh, the, the worst of the pandemic and say, oh, see how much better things have been without going back to the high point of Trump's tenure, which things were a lot better, but they don't want to do that. So we don't know. We don't know. Columbus continued to Cuba, which he called Juana, J-U-A-N-A. At the time, he thought he had reached the Far East and referred to the dark-skinned people he found as Indians. Now, again, this is the assumption of some scholars. Other scholars say he knew he didn't reach the Far East, but he had to come up with a name. He found these Indians, quote, very well formed with handsome bodies and good faces, quote, and he hoped to convert them, quote, to our holy faith by love rather than by force and giving them red caps, glass beads, and many other things of small value. Dispatching emissaries into the interior to contact the great Khan, Columbus's scouts returned with no reports of the spices, jewels, or silks, or other evidence of Cathay, nor did the Khan send his regards. By December, he, Columbus, had turned southeast to explore the island he named Hispaniola, which contains the modern-day states of Haiti and Dominican Republic. There he left 39 men behind to found the settlement of La Navidad. Nevertheless, Columbus returned to Spain confident he had found an ocean passage to the Orient. Again, Davidson disagrees, and he says that this is not really proven. He he may have returned to say he had found the Orient, uh, knowing in his heart that he didn't. Now, let's take just a moment here and talk about Howard Zinn, the worst historian in American history, and that's saying a lot. Uh, Howard Zinn's famous book, or more or less infamous book, um, People's History of the United States, um, lies in so many ways. And a lot of his lies take place right off the bat with Columbus. And so one of the things he does is Zen uses ellipses. The ellipses in writing and in historical writing consists of three dots, or if you're ending a sentence, four dots. It means, in essence, the author has left this out. Now, under what conditions are scholars allowed to use ellipses with any integrity? The main condition is that it not in any way alter, change, or uh, otherwise impact the gist, the importance of the, sentence, uh, of the sentence. So, for example, the police arrested Bruce, who was wearing a blue coat, and took him to jail. Now, you are allowed to use ellipses to take out that part that says who was wearing a blue coat. If the blue coat doesn't show up in his trials, it's not a part of the case, nobody cares, it's just an irrelevant factoid that somebody put in. But if what you take out substantially changes the meaning, you absolutely cannot use ellipses to connect things. You cannot use ellipses to connect two different statements made at two different times. You can use them to connect different statements in a paragraph. If like you want to end a sentence and leave off something and put four dots, that shows that the sentence has ended and a new sentence has started. But you certainly can't use it for different times, things said at different times, and absolutely not at different days. Okay, but the key one here is you cannot use an ellipses to alter or change the meaning of what you are quoting. Howard Zinn does this all the time. In one of his first discussions of Columbus, he uses ellipses to try and make it look like Columbus, in one of his first meeting with these Indians, comes ashore wielding his sword, 
and kind of threatening the Indians, and they're cowed by his militaristic behavior and so on and so forth. And he refers to them as good-looking people that he can make into slaves. That is not what Columbus's diary says at all. The gist of what his diary says is this. We came ashore. After some great discussion, we learned to communicate using symbols. I noticed that the Indians had scars on their bodies, and I asked them where they got the scars. And they said, from another Indian tribe who has been enslaving us. So the very first people Columbus encounters are Indians who had been enslaved by other Indians. Got it? Not Europeans, by other Indians. Second thing that happens is the Indians see his sword, and they, they kind of point to it. And are, what is that? Is that a lightsaber? What is that? And so Columbus pulls it out and shows it to them, and they, they feel a sharp edge. They had nothing like that because they had not learned to mine metal and to purify steel, anything like that. They're behind. Okay, They're behind by three, 400 years. Uh, and, of course, um, scholars don't want to say that because that would make the Europeans look too important. But the fact was they were behind. And, and so Columbus shows them the sword, and they essentially say, man, what we could have done to those guys if we'd had a few of these. And Columbus said, you know, these were good-looking people, and that's probably why the other Indians enslaved them. He didn't say, oh, they're good-looking people, and they make good slaves for us. That wasn't what he said. So Zen lied, 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 lied like a dog or as Biden would say, like dog-faced pony soldier, okay? Uh, but Zinn does this throughout his book. He uses um, ellipses. He uses selective quotations. Um, and, and, you know, you can prove anything uh, with a book. With our book, you could prove anything with the Bible. Judas went out and hung himself. Go ye therefore and do likewise. Whatever ye do, do quickly. Of course, that's not what the Bible says. It says those three things, but not in that context. So deliberately, Zinn leaves out the context every time he can and alters the meaning with ellipses, which is an absolute verboten. All right. Reality gradually forced Columbus to a new conclusion. He had not reached India or China, and after a second voyage in 1493, still convinced he was in the Pacific Ocean, Columbus admitted he had stumbled on a new landmass, perhaps even a new continent of astounding natural resources and wealth. In February 1493, he wrote his Spanish patrons that Hispaniola and other islands like it were, quote, fertile to a limitless degree, possessing mountains covered by trees of a thousand kinds and tall, so that they seemed to touch the sky. He confidently promised gold, cotton, and spices, as much as their highnesses could command, in return for only minimal continued support. Meanwhile, he continued to probe the Mundus Novus, the New World, south and west, after returning to Spain yet again, Columbus made two more voyages to the New World in 1498 and 1502. Um, you know, we, we just rattled that off. I mean, can you imagine spending three months at a time at sea, being thrown back and forth, being constantly seasick, I mean, being in danger, all, and you just go back and forth, you know, it's just, we say it like it's just making a trip to the store, but these were incredibly difficult voyages, and they were uh, uh, very dangerous, and, and the fact that he did one is amazing, but the fact that he did four of these is just mind-boggling at this time. Um, all right. Let's do one more paragraph. Whether Columbus had found parts of the Far East or an entirely new land was irrelevant to what most Europeans thought at the time. Political distractions abounded in Europe. Spain had barely evicted the Muslims after the long Reconquista, and England's Wars of the Roses had scarcely ended. News of Columbus's discovery excited only a few monarchs, explorers, and dreamers. Remember, 
exploration is only good in free nations. Still, the prospect of finding a waterway to Asia infatuated sailors, and Columbus's proof of the existence of the trade winds from the east greatly shortened the journey westward. But another man would gain the glory of the name of the new territories. In 1501, a Florentine passenger on a Portuguese voyage, Amerigo Vespucci, wrote letters to his friends in which he described the New World. His self-promoting dispatches circulated sooner than Columbus's own written accounts, and as a result, the term America was soon attached by geographers to the continents in the Western Hemisphere that should rightly have been named Columbia. But if Columbus did not receive the honor of having the New World named for him, and if he acquired only temporal wealth and fame in Spain, receiving from the crown the title Admiral of the Ocean Sea, his place in history was never in doubt. Historian Samuel Elliott Morrison, a worthy seaman in his own right, also reenacted Colombian voyages in 1939 and 1940, described Columbus as, quote, the sign and symbol of the new age of hope, glory, and accomplishment. Uh, so it's, it's really quite an achievement that uh, Columbus pulled off there. And just one more comment here on this notion of free nations and free societies exploring. And the reason, yes, once in a while you're going to find a, a dictatorship or a totalitarian state exploring, but the problem there is you can't come back with the wrong answer. If you come back with an answer that the dictator doesn't like, you're dead. Right? And so this squelches all real discovery, all real um, uh, invention, all real exploration. Columbus wasn't afraid, even though he worked for a king, he wasn't afraid to come back and say, you know, I, I may not have found China. But I, I may have found something even better. Right? So it's worth keeping in mind the role of freedom in exploration and and how the United States today has just completely dropped all that as it has become a less and less and less free nation. We're no longer interested in exploration. Why? Because the answers that come back may not be those that the regime in power wants to hear. All right, everybody, I'm going to wrap this up. I want to remind you, I am still working on getting a chat going. Uh, I need to do this a few more times where I'm really comfortable with turning out these videos and then we'll get a chat. But if you have specific questions, email me at Larry at wildworldhistory.com and I will see if I can work those in first thing. Now this is brought to you by the Wild World of History. If you're not familiar with it, this is a history curriculum website. You'll want to check it out and look at, at the VIP subscription, which features ongoing video lessons, including the 1620 default. Why 1620? and not Jamestown in 1619 with slavery, is the model, the essence of American exceptionalism. Slavery has nothing to do with American exceptionalism, and Plymouth, not Jamestown, is the real model for American exceptionalism. There's a series on Reagan, the American president. That's about 21 videos. There's one on the horrible history of Howard Zinn that goes into more detail of what I talked about. There's all sorts of ongoing lessons at the VIP subscription, $6 a month at the Wild World of History. But if you're a history teacher or instructor, I've got a full curriculum in U.S. history and world history. U.S. from Columbus to Trump, 22 lessons that tie specifically to Patriots History of the United States and the Patriots History Reader. And I've got a world history course with 15 lessons that goes from 1775 to the present, and each of these courses has videos, video lessons taught by me, 22 video lessons, one for every chapter of Patriots History of the United States, and 15 video lessons for the World History course. So you want to take advantage of those. We actually have a convention pricing going right now of $179 per course or $349 for both courses. It's all digital, all downloadable, no license to expire. You can use it with as many kids as you want. So check it out on the website at the Wild World of History. And I am now going to be going over to Locals, 
where I will go to my subscription site. We haven't worked out exactly what the pay is for now, so I think you're, you're there free for now. Uh, but, but soon that will be a subscription site. And we're going to talk politics with the Patriot Plus show. And we'll be talking about President Trump and the impending supposed indictment and what all that means and so on. So next week, come back in. We will continue with the voyages of exploration with some of the other countries. And until 